money, Jordan Bell fur. Stacking penny stocks while I'm flipping these birds. Sipping on Ciroc, trip them up with the words. I done popped the molly and I think it's be my third. What is going on, DJ Nation? Kenny Kim here bringing you another Fantasy Golf Degenerates podcast this week for the Valspar Championship. As usual, I am here with everybody's favorite Canadian, Tyler Tambaline. Tyler, we missed you last week. How was your vacation? Everything good? Yeah, man. Everything was good. Happy to be back. You said as usual. It has not been as usual lately. We've been off and on, but that's good. Need a little I break. Think, I think we're going to be good for the rest of the year, man. Give or take a week or two, so you guys don't have to worry. Yeah, uh, I don't plan good. on missing anything unless I'm sick or anything. Yeah, mm-hmm. back at it again, though. Excited to be back. Go through this one with you. Had a great week to talk about. We'll get to the players in a second. Before we do, though, I want to remind everyone very quickly, this show is brought to you and presented by ShipItNation.com. Now's a great time to join. If you go, I said last week, join for the players, stay for the Masters. If you join for the Valspar, you can use code MASTERS15. Gets you 15% off, and the setup is easy. If you get in right now after... Uh, today, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it is, you'll get right through the Masters, including all the showdown slates, which are usually pretty good over the weekend. So, yeah, Scheffler gets the job done, Kenny. We'll get into it, but how was your week, man? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, like, personally, for me, the week was great. Uh, so, uh, the week started off for me with the underdog play that we had uh, on the show last week. What I didn't realize is if you play a two-man underdog pick them and one of, the, one of the picks pushes, you get your money back. So, I was hyped about that. One of the picks from the show last week pushed one one, got our money back. It's better than nothing, right? The next thing that happened hit Xander, first round leader. Uh, I got a boost to forty five to one. Now again, it was chopped, but I also had the each way uh, for five places. So that basically covered my gambling plus some. Uh, then Friday, I hit a three man. Uh, underdog fantasy pick them for eleven hundred dollars, and then Saturday night, I I bet Scotty Scheffler live twenty eight to one, um, twenty eight to one on when he was on fifteen, uh, he ended up birding sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen to get back into it, and he was like eight to one by the end of the day. So the closing line value was really solid on that, and of course he won. And then Sunday, I guess Underdog has these crazy, like, scorcher multipliers on Sundays only. Um, And so I I made a bet. It was, uh, I made, no, not a bet. I made a pick them. It was Aberg, minus two and a half, uh, less than two and a half bogeys. Hideki, less than two and a half bogeys. And Scheffler, less than 0.5 bogeys with a five-time multiplier. Um, so for the multiplier, it was like, I think it was like 25 times the multiplier I had for that. And I I put the max bet on it and I won six grand (laughs) on that one underdog bet. And it was, you know, the funny thing is if I bet all, if I did all three pickums, 0.5 under bogeys, I would have won like $32,000. Uh, now, you know, I mean, you're just looking at it's you know, the what if game and no one really likes to play that game. Uh, but still, uh, and then I forgot. I also had Decky, uh, each way eight places. So it was like a fucking huge, like the biggest week I've had, I withdrew five figures. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I withdrew $10,000, um, this past week in the last eight days, counting last week's underdog play, I withdrawn 10 grand. So it's been a very, 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 very good, uh, couple of weeks for me. Right. When we start, Underdog Fantasy, and of course, uh, we'll go over that here in a minute, but of course, use promo code MAYO, get yourself a 100% deposit match up to $100 uh, on Underdog Fantasy. Um, now, hi, let's go how you did, and then let's go over the week, because what a tournament, what an event. Yeah, it doesn't matter, like, I didn't barely play, I was in Bahamas. Oh, yeah, you're on vacation. Yeah. Any great stories? a few entries in there, I didn't get anything out, I finished 77th in the Millie, and then I had tickets to the 33-33, and those didn't cash, so yeah, nothing... Special my way last week, but had a great week. I can tell you that much. Down in the great weather in the Bahamas, great food. It's with my wife of ten years. Oh man, you should have stayed, stayed this so. week so you could see Tiger and Yasser meet I today. Just stayed, yeah. I should have stayed. Right, there right. And tried to get live on site with Tambo interviewing <laughs> Yasser uh, and Tiger up on Tiger's yacht. Uh, I didn't. The Bahamas see, is what I didn't like see those guys. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about yachts, though, for sure. I'm thinking about Bermuda, which is like two miles long. Bahamas a little bit bigger, right? 
the Bermuda. Um, but yeah, so we missed you last week, but what an event. Uh, first off, the TV coverage was spectacular. Uh, so many golf shots, so little commercials. It, this is the way it should be. And I know the way the PGA Tour is, it can't be every week. But we need more than like one week a year on the PGA Tour for coverage like this. They got to be able to do something where they can get maybe like like the signature events with a cut, right? Get get all the signature events with a cut like this, where the sponsors opt them. I'll say them out loud because everyone should be buying their shit for doing what they did. Opt them. Uh, Comcast. Morgan Stanley. Thank you. Thank you for for doing what you did and 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 covering uh, the commercials for the players because it was spectacular. Like especially in the morning. Uh, before the real coverage started, ESPN Plus had all access. You could see every single golfer in the field um, you know, that you want. This is the way coverage should be. And I know it's a pipe dream to think about having this type of coverage every single week, but give it to me more than once a year. Give it to me like, you know, the majors are usually good coverage. Give me like four more events, five more events. So we can make it like 10 events a year where you get this type of coverage and watch the ratings for those 10 events will be insane because it made everything so much more fluid, right? From, from, a, from a viewing standpoint and from a casual fan standpoint, you know, it will keep the casual fan more entertained, more focused because there's not a commercial break every three minutes. Um, now, uh, what do you, and what did you think about the cover? Did you get to watch any Tambo? Yeah, I got to watch uh, at least a, a day and a half, and I got to watch the last ten or ten or so holes once I got home from the airport. So I got to see the the finale of it all, but uh, I didn't see all that stuff. Like I didn't get to, to enjoy the better coverage or anything like that. I think the the takeaway there though was what no, we you always did. say. If you watched it. It was you know the whole all, all weekend was the uh, was the uh, n- limited commercials. Yeah, that that I did. I definitely didn't see very much of that. But like I said, the the setup was because it's like in the PGA's hometown. Like everything's like right there, right? Like you said, yeah. I don't know. And we've talked about this forever. Like it doesn't seem. But like did they, they move the PGA office to Austin? Is is that their home area still? I just can't I hear they... people talk about that, so I don't know if it was true or not. But again, yeah. like I said, the the setup of it, I didn't see ratings either yet come out because I saw someone posted. I thought that was true. They said if ratings are down for this one, we're in big yeah. trouble because yeah, not only fox. the coverage and then the fact of what we got out of the leaderboard, which we'll talk about in a second. But I mean, in the end. You know, it's Scotty got to the top. I, had Scotty not have got up there, I'm not sure if people would be saying the same when it was Xander, Clark, Siwoo. You know, it's still good. I mean, it was obviously incredible down the stretch to the end, but Scotty winning that was super, it's sort of an added bonus. I wish Wyndham or Xander, Z- I wish Xander birdied 17 or Wyndham's pot went down because it's the three hole aggregate playoff. It would have been incredible. Like, I mean, yeah. we missed out on the last chance we would have got at the Monday. 18 hole playoff between DJ and Speeth in their prime at Chambers Bay because DJ had that three putt from eight feet or whatever. And then Wyndham double fist pump thinking about it, didn't get there with it, couldn't get it to go down. Xander on 17. Oh, I didn't want so to see cool, that play. Man. Like, I, I audibly like gasped, like when that ball rolled out. Let, let's speak about the now. Let's speak about the tournament a little bit. Like, Scheffler, I know a lot of us people, the DFS guys, the gambling guys, we don't want to see Scheffler win every week. It sort of fucks us because not we don't often bet the favorites. Like we're not like, you know, and the funny thing is you see like the handles and the most money spent. Um, it's usually with the favorite. And that's probably not us, right? <laughs> that's probably not us. That's probably the casual that are going out and betting. Um, and, but the thing about the casuals is like a dynasty, like uh, an elite player who's winning everything, like that will bring more people to the game. And, and I think Scotty, I don't know, something different was different about him this week. Like in the beginning, that press conference on Wednesday, when he spoke of when someone asked him, like, who do you blame uh, for this rift uh, in golf right now? I was like, shit, the guys who left. If they didn't fucking leave, there would be no rift. I'm blaming them. I was like, God damn, really? I mean, like, he literally, I mean, it wasn't exactly the way I see it, said it, but it was pretty fucking close, right? And I was like, wow. I mean, like, he's really putting it out there. Um, you didn't really see Scotty saying stuff like that at all, right? Uh, I don't know if he's getting more comfortable in his skin about being a leader, about being a superstar, 
the superstar on the PGA Tour. Maybe he's getting more comfortable in his skin. Um, I don't know. Uh, and then what he did Friday, basically, it's his Willis Reed moment. Like, everything that happened with him this week should make him, you know, should make him be from a star to a superstar. He's he's our superstar now. And now he doesn't need to win some more majors. But as of now, he is our superstar. Uh, and what he did Friday, where he could barely, he was getting the neck massage, like, in the middle of the round, and then asked it around Ted Scott, is like, I don't think he could play tomorrow. Like you're like, what? You don't think he could play tomorrow, right? Um, and then and then going out there and and having a, a, a you know a so so Saturday round, and then birdie 16, 17, and 18 to get right back in it. And then coming in on Sunday and just starting off strong with that with that eagle on a four, right? That just sent it off for the whole day. And uh, it was pretty incredible stuff what he did. Uh, now, Xander, he didn't play horribly, but he does what Xander sort of does. Like, he'll play very, very well for, like, 69 holes and be in the lead. And then, like, there'll be, like, the last three or four holes. It seems like the pressure really gets to Xander. Um, 13 runner-up finishes. now. I think he only has, like, six wins, maybe even less. Uh, you know, 13 runner-up finishes. That's... That's definitely saying something about Xander Shoffley. Now, do I think it's going to be like that forever? No. Uh, do I think he'll get his major and he'll get his wins? Yes. But, it, it, you know, he, he didn't play horribly, but he's not playing like a champion, like Scotty did, or like Wyndham Clark. Uh, I mean, the thing about Clark is, first off, he, he chunked that ball on 17 um, on Saturday and then made that miraculous bogey, right? And then on Sunday... He wasn't great, right? He was a little bit off of the whole time, and he sort of was falling down the leaderboard just a little bit. But then on the back nine of the few holes left, he starts turning it up, right? And, and like people who do, there's not that many golfers in the world that can do that, right? Because it ends up being like Sunday pressure. When you fall off a little bit, your game just falls off the whole time. He knew his game wasn't on, and then he came roaring back. On with the, with one of the only birdies on seventeen, right? Uh, almost an eagle on sixteen, right? And then that fucking lip out on eighteen. Um, really, it was spectacular tournament, spectacular leaderboard. You had Harmon up there, of course, who probably should have won as well because he didn't birdie twelve or sixteen. Basically, the two easiest holes on the course on Sunday. He birdies those two. He wins. Right? He wins. <laughs> so he probably should have won. Um, Siwoo with an unbelievable Sunday. Decky looking really strong out there. Looking like he could be one of the people that can take Scheffler at the Masters because of how well his ball striking is. Um, yeah. Uh, what, did you, what did you think of the, the any, any, anything stick out to you, Tambo? I guess the like you said the ending stuff like the Shoffley thing always comes up and now it's thirteen times like you said in the runner out it's just unfortunate the timing because you go like flip it the other way everyone sees the Clark lip out and that's just because the actual result of it would have meant playoff and, you know it's the same thing the seventeen you, should he make it yeah you'd expect Xander to make that putt on seventeen he just didn't if that was the eighteenth it would feel the same like if you flip those situations it's now the same feeling about that but the the stuff with the long term with him I guess. You got to compare it to other guys in history. Uh, we were joking earlier, like all, all the stuff. I, I put the joke out there about, you know, Wyndham Clark, is he the next uh, Patrick Reed? But, you know, because earlier in the day it was, is he the next Brooks Kepka? And it's like, maybe he's the best. Maybe he's the next Phil Mickelson because, you know, he knows how to bend the rules in his favor. I didn't, I don't actually think he cheated. All the stuff was fine by the rules. It's just funny. He's the guy that pops up every single time that we see stamping his feet down and doing stuff that you would think. Wouldn't be cool, but it, it's it's technically within the rules. Yeah. And then the other thing is the, uh, you know, Phil didn't win his first major until he was 35. So people were on the case of you can't call him Kepka when Kepka's only like two years older and has four more majors than him on top of other stuff. But the way he's been playing is, you know, solid, a rock solid in these yeah. tough events. But then you could also say someone called it today. I thought this was the funniest nickname was the little big game hunter, Ryan Harmon. He's doing the same thing. He's showing up at all these huge events yeah. right at the top, winning the Open, the chance to win this one. He's been in the mix at U.S. Open stuff. The, the, the guys like Scheffler, Xander, Clark, Harmon, 
Fitzpatrick, all these guys. Harmon Nick, really, the like way US he was Open. driving the ball on that back nine until like the last couple of holes was really impressive. The Thigala but, quotes, but, did you see Thigala? I did. I was reading more news than Watcher, but Thigala quotes on him were pretty rock solid too. When you think about like how long Harmon's been doing it, the ups and downs he's also been through, but like he drives the ball. It's longer than you would expect for a guy of his stature. He just doesn't make a lot of mistakes. I think he called him a striper. You know, like he, he's out there just making it happen. And he's well, I mean, that shot on 18, yeah. right? He needed a birdie to win, and it ended up, he hit it from the pine straw, and the shot looked like it was going in the fucking hole, yeah. right? And then the ball, I don't know how it happened, but, like, the ball literally just stopped when it hit the ground. Uh, from the pine straw, you'd expect, like, a rollout, right? Um, He could have had, like, a two-foot putt for Eric. Um, I think that's what he wanted, uh, instead of, like, a you know, an 18-foot putt. Uh I mean, going back to Wyndham Clark, I don't think he's Kepka, but he has Kepka tendencies, right? I mean, like, coming up clutch at the end, I know he didn't this time, but it was fucking close. Really doing well at big-time events. He just needs a couple more majors, and then, you know, maybe, right? Yeah, you, gotta, <laughs> I mean, you gotta see yeah. everything play out. Like you said with yeah. Scotty, you know, Scotty's a different story. One, one thing I'll say about Scotty I think is so funny is because obviously the SS does stand for superstar. Like you said, we've seen it, but what if He's just getting bored now, Kenny. And it was like, you know how Michael Jordan would like make up fake beef if you watch The Last Dance? He's like, I just need to create a rivalry. Yeah. So I go <laughs> off tonight. Well, all the people said all week is you can't see nobody wins back to back at the players. There's no chance. What the dude was like number one in all the stats. The mallet butter has been incredible for him back to back weeks winning with it. What, what I mean, he was like 10, 11 back at one point on Saturday. Maybe he just made that shit up to give himself something to push himself, you know? Like, you know, say my neck is fucked up. Let me go out and see what I can do with all the pressure really on me and try and make it like a Scotty flu game, Scotty neck game, and he goes out and finds a way to the to the top. Scotty neck Neckler, we got him up at the top getting another win. So I don't know. It's incredible stuff. We talked about all the game, all the times last season. This is the other thing too, variance, right? We, we talked about in DFS and betting and all these different things, like shit happens. But think about last season. How many times did we get on this pod or show and talk about Scotty Scheffler and say he literally just gave away the win with it with that putter. Like he was right there. He should there was like five wins we counted. He on. missed like the one ball. putt. Yeah. On 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 Sunday. I think he missed like one putt. I think it was on like 16 or something like that. Or something late. He missed like one putt. But what a time and turn. I'm saying, do you like let me ask you this? And again, we'll never know the answer, but just curious. I mean, literally, he we talked about three to five wins last season that we we said were his that he just didn't get. And that's just the way it goes. If you got if he had a found any type of putter, he would have yeah. he would have won by a handful. Now, he give he, does he give up all those to be the first ever back to back players champion? He has to. It's what happened anyway. But I'm saying in his mindset, you just keep grinding through it and playing. And now you go back to back weeks at API and the players and just get you know one of the biggest. What was it, eight or nine million dollars too? Yeah. On top of it all, so I mean, just mm -hmm. everything that goes with it. It's the way it goes. Those second places and top five finishes where he should have, could have, whatever won. To now get this, it's it's quite the trade off, and it just you got to stick with it, man. The big one is always right around the corner as long as you keep grinding through. Yeah, the only narrative he has to beat now is winning after April, right? I mean, like I guess he doesn't do that that often. That that'll be the next narrative that he has to beat. Let's go back to Wyndham Clark real quick uh, because there's been some instances of people think he's straight up fucking cheating. Like when I first saw what he did with that drop, he basically did like the Samoan like war dance haku like on top of the area where he was going to drop the ball right like literally stamping down and like i was, was i was like, oh left to the, like slide to the left yeah 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 Fly, yeah like a little twist there twist yeah. like, you know i mean I was, and so I, I i guess that's not against the rules um it can't be against the rules because everybody saw what the fuck he was doing and no there was no action like, it, it can't be against the rules. If it is against the rules, then I don't know what the fuck the PGA Tour is doing. Okay? So, so so I'm going with the fact that it's not against the rules. I'm not a rule guy. I do not know. The rule guys um, for sure opt in the comments because I was just posting as a joke. I was making fun of the earlier in the one in the day when everyone was like, he's yeah. the next cap because it's hard to place that on him this early. The rules guys said it was legal? Rules guys all said it's fine. I'm good with that. I'm not a rules guy. I don't follow it. I don't care. I, I just, So, I mean, shit. I, knew that. I, I didn't know that. If I had known that, I'd be doing that shit 
on all my jobs. I don't know how it's it fucking, is. Like, usually it's it comes smart as shit, it, right? It's, it's incredibly smart to do. Does it improve the lie, though, is the question. Of and course it me, does. That's what I didn't understand about it, so the rules guys can hit me up again and let me know, because yeah. I don't care. I don't need to be right on this. But, but it's, not, it's not improving the lie of the ball where it is. Because okay. you don't know where you're going to drop it. You don't know where it's going to land. <laughs> Let me just prove everywhere and then see what happens. Yeah, yeah I, I, it's crazy. But the way it then, works, you know, yeah, that's why I said the next thing last week where Brandle actually said it was a penalty, where, you know, he, he put his club behind the ball and the ball moved down. Now, personally, for that rule, I think that he didn't improve his line. So I think technically that verbiage of that rule is you your lie has to improve. And it basically just sunk deeper yeah. down well, into the Bermuda rock. Right? Anyway, and that's yeah. why I said the next fill, because it's whoever knows how to bend them the best. Yeah. And, and it also always comes back to the same thing. If he's not doing anything wrong and other people can do it, then they say in golf, they always say that's fair because anybody could do the same thing Wyndham did. So then in that case, he should do what he's allowed to do and get away with it. But the re I usually hate that one when we talk about the backstopping. Because while everybody can backstop, it's crazy when it's a playoff and someone puts it in the fairway and has to click it up for their second shot and somebody's behind the grandstand, like just slightly blocked. You both also knew the grandstand was there. One guy hit a proper shot. One guy just blasted it. And he's like, well, that guy could have done it too. But it just, it, it changes the game a little bit. Like, I don't know. Either way, my thing is whatever he's doing is fine. I, if, it's, if the rules say it's fine. Go ahead. Yeah. It's just funny that his one popped up. People think you're trying to knock him down. It's just commenting on what you saw. The guy's been involved online in our same space. We always talk shit about, you know, the, the Pebble Beach one where he stamped it down. The API where the club did similar to what Rom did at Memorial, but apparently didn't improve the lie or it's such a technicality that who knows. And then, like you said, it was like a dance move on the thing. Someone also said, I didn't go back and look because, again, I don't give a shit, but someone else went back and said, he took an extra club length, but I, they would have called that shit. I said, he got a guy, hey, he's on TV. If he's really going to break a rule badly, they have to call it, right? I mean, like, so I don't think he broke anything. I don't think he broke any rules. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before we go off, I do get a shout out to the PGA Tour because what a week. Uh, this is what we needed. Uh, shout out to the PGA uh, Tour social media. Uh, they were doing some, they actually, that Rory Oblin Spieth interaction on the first day with the rules and the drops and the turtles and all that shit. That was great fucking content. And normally in that type of situation, you know, the the PJ would scrub everything from that from online. But they actually posted the entire 10 minute segment on their social media, right? They had some funny things happen. Like I don't know if you saw on their social media, they had this one where they were interviewing golfers with a guy that mumbles. And yeah. like you can't understand like what he's saying, right? But like he's, he's interviewing the golfers, and the golfers are trying to understand what he's saying. And, like some guys are giving answers for literally the guys saying gibberish. And I thought that was hilarious. Um, they said that they would change uh, the the PJ Tour logo to Scotty. You know, with they got the somebody logo. new for sure. There's they that after person running. They after. after. Was shy, you know, you know, we give the PJ Tour a bunch of shit every week. Because of their pro when they do something good, we got to give them props. And I got to give them props for this week. I mean, what a fantastic week of golf in all from from on the course to the TV to uh, the social media. They did a great fucking job. Um, I, I, and I know we can't get this every week, but give me more than one week of this a year. And you'll, you're going to and you're going to get more more fans, more people watching this product all right so let's move on let's talk about our, our winner for the um comment section so make sure every week go to our youtube page comment comment page and pick your winner and add your dk handle right and if you if you are the first one to pick the winner you get to go against me and tambo in a three-man you win the three-man you get into our tournament of champions uh, in the in the Sony Open, and we don't have a listener league anymore, and we don't have one for underdog yet. We'll probably work on something with them, but as of now, we don't. So this is your only way to get in to the tournament of champions for a bunch of prizes, cash, all that good shit. So make sure you go to the YouTube comment section on our YouTube page, pick the winner, put your DK handle. Now we have our first 
second two-time winner now. Um, because I'm going based upon when, uh, you know, the, the first one to go ahead and put the winner. The first one to pick Scheffler this past week was impeccably coming up once again. Uh, this is his second win in, I think, three or four weeks. Um, so good for him. He'll come back. If you're going to pick the favorite, you better get on early, right? <laughs> the pick and be the first one on because that's what this guy did. He's on for a second time. All right, before we move on to this week, let's do our underdog segment here, Tambo. Like I said last week, um, pretty incredible stuff. If you're not on underdog, I don't know why. Uh, I know uh, Mayo and Jeff, they're doing the draft part. They do that all the time. They're getting strategies for that. Um, I'm a pick em guy. Uh, I've won almost 10 grand uh, in the last, in the first two weeks I've played uh, on the pick em. Uh, now, one of the couple of strategy things. Uh, that I wanted to go over before we do our picks for this week. Um, I don't like the first round. Um, there's so much variance, right? Um, you know, and a golfer can play like shit one week, and then the next week you can go out and win the event. That's just the name of the game, right? So that first day, I'm not a big fan. Now, for the podcast, we're going to have a, a, a day one, you know, pick them every week. That's what we're going to do. But that's going to be the only pick them i'm gonna do for day one um on the weekends i think is the best because you have an idea of how the guys are playing uh you have a little bit more idea uh of like what to expect from these guys and a lot of the times when it comes to underdog they don't change their numbers uh for example the course wasn't playing very difficult on saturday and sunday right um and they still had the best players in the world who are the best ball strikers of the event Oberg, Scheffler, and Hideki um, at two and a half bogeys, and that was the pick em number. Um, so, you know, you could find stuff like that as the week goes on. Uh, so I like the weekend play better. But we do have our uh, segment. So my pick em for this week, it's a two man pick em. It's always, probably always going to be a two man pick em for the show. But Nelson Adcock of uh, Cut Sweats, a uh, friend of the pod, he is a mass guy, right? Numbers guy. And he told me that three-man and five-man pick have much better VIG for us. Um, you know, you're getting more, more bang for your buck in a three-man and a five-man um, pick -em. But I don't want to do three-mans for the first day, okay? Because I want to win, right? And so uh, I'm doing a two-man pick -em. For this week, it's going to be for the first round. It's going to be Taylor Moore lower than 70.70 70 and a half strokes. The par 71, all he has to do is shoot under par. Taylor Moore shot under par in, I think, 13 of his last, like, 18 rounds. So around a 70% clip. Of course, he's the winner from last year. He's made, I think he might be leading the PGA Tour in cuts made consecutively because i think it's like 12 or 13 um if you're making that many cuts in a row you're not shooting over bar very often right um and going back to the the winner from last week so all he has to do is shoot one under par and we hit that um my next one is min Wu lee higher than two and a half bogeys or worse um six of his last eight rounds min Wu's had three bogeys or more all eight of his last eight rounds he's had two bogeys or more He's never played this course. It is top five, top 10, most difficult course on the PGA Tour. Um, so, you know, I'm going for the first round, first time seeing this course and what he can do because he can go off a lot. Um, and if you look at his numbers, um, I mean, it just doesn't fit what we're looking for this week, right? I mean, like in the last 24 rounds, he's 110th. In stroke skin approach, he's 110th from 175 to 200, which is like where the majority of all approach shots are going to be. He's 141st in this field in par three scoring. The par threes here, very difficult. A lot of them over 200 yards. I think he can get the bogeys just on the par threes. Um, so that's what I'm going. It pays 3.6 times. So again, um, Taylor Moore. 70 and a half strokes. I'm going under. 
and I'm going Min Woo Lee, two and a half bogeys or worse, over. Um, more than. I don't not over. I can't say over. What do I gotta say? Higher than. Sorry, higher than two and a half bogeys or worse, and that's gonna pay three point five ish uh, on your bet, Tamba. Yeah, mine is similar, but for what it pays. But on the three picks that we talked about, and I just focus on the bogeys. I do like one thing you said, especially for the the round one stuff. You can just sort of play it, uh, you know, with less of your bankroll, right? You you obviously are betting more over the weekend when you have more information. Maybe you find more edge, but there is still edge to be found. For example, right now, literally um, ninety percent of the guys have the same bogeys or worse for those that have it listed, and there's quite a few options. So if, like you said, you found out. That there was, and I'm not saying there is, but let's say you found out there was a weather edge. Yeah. I don't know how quickly they go to adapt for it. If you want to find that as your angle in, I'm still going to take the hires on the bogeys or worse. Just because, like you said, course is hard. I hope that we finally get a course where they actually let it play hard. But we'll see. Uh, you know, set it up tough, all that. But again, because no one really has the simple yet. Like you said, very tough course either way. So two guys that were in the mix. One with a lot of short game. One that always shows up at the players is Doug Gim. Two and a half bogeys or worse, higher. Mav McNeely, two and a half bogeys or worse, higher. Mav was like all short game, keep it a minute. Could he do it again? Yes, but tough to do around a place like this and can still find a couple, find those three bogeys and, and do, or worse, and do and do the same. So I think we're fine there. And then Bo Hostler, just a guy that didn't really pop up for me anywhere on anything, and two and a half bogeys or worse for him. So if you got McNeely, Hostler, and Doug Gim, all three of them, it's just under four to one on the hires, so I'll take those three, Kenny. One thing before we move on, I will say, on Sundays, it looks like Underdog Fantasy does crazier Scorcher, like, pick -ups. So a Scorcher it will add to your multiplier, uh, basically, when it comes to how much you're going to win. Uh, the the Scheffler .5 or under um, pick -em was a five-time multiplier. Um, the funny thing is, and, and like everybody had like a five time or a three time multiplier in in their thing, so you could really like do some crazy stuff uh, on Sunday. Basically, like the three guys I had, I had Aberg, Hideki under two and a half. They didn't have a single bogey at all, and of course Scheffler went bogey free. So all three went bogey free. If I went point five bogeys or under for all three, and I bet the max, my max bet is two hundred fifty dollars. They won't let me bet more than that. Um, I would have won thirty two thousand dollars. So there's, there's some crazy stuff uh, that you can get done over on Underdog Fantasy. All right, before we move on to this week, let's go ahead and pay some bills. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. It's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry. Whether you like head-to-head -head or pick-em games, personally, I like the pick-em games. Pick whether your favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total in this week's event for a chance to win big. Pick between two and five players to build a pick-em entry. You can win up to 100 times your money in a single night. You can also make rivals picks, which pits two players against each other. This past week, I used it for Rory shooting under 70 in round one and Spieth more than two and a half bogeys in round one. Sign up today with promo code MAYO and you get your first deposit doubled up to $100 as well as an instant pick -em special. Must be 18 years or older and present in the state where underdog fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concerned with your play? Call 1-800-522-4700 or visit www.ncpgambling.org. All right, so let's get back to this week. The PGA Tour moves to Tampa Bay uh, this week for the Valspar Championship, which will be played on the Copper Red Course at Innisbrook Resort. This is a great course that brings every type of golfer into play, but is usually presented with a less-than-stellar field due to its placement in the schedule. Uh, two years ago was probably the best they ever had. Uh, now with the elevated events, this turning once again weaker field, but you know a little bit top heavy. At least we got some studs up top that we can go with. Well, once you get past like a nine k range, you, you know you're looking at like a a, a pretty weak field event. Uh, there is plenty of course history here. The tournament's been played here since 2000. There was like a renovation in 2015, but it really didn't change that much. Uh, this course is routinely one of the hardest on tour, ranking like around the top 10 most difficult courses on the PGA Tour year in and year out. Weather and wind can play a major factor here as winds above 50 miles per hour, pretty normal. 
I've seen different wind forecasts for this week already. Uh, and the worst days look like Friday and Sunday with 30 mile per hour gusts. Uh, there is some rain um, in the forecast Friday and it rained today, Monday. Now, I talked to a friend who lives in Tampa and he said they've had less rain than usual so far this year. So I would expect the course to maybe dry out uh, a bit by Thursday and we should see firm and fast conditions. Again, it could rain on Friday as well. And again, that's dangerous too because remember what happened last time at the players where the rain and the weather sort of flipped the wave advantage. That can happen again. So you got to be careful. Um, now, one tidbit of information, uh, 15 of the last 16 winners had a top 10 during their during the season leading up to their victory at Copperhead. That includes the fall swing when the fall swing was a part of the new season, the wrap All right, so the Copperhead course, 7,300-plus yard par 71, five par threes. Again, that's why I don't like Min Wu. That's why I, I think he can get three or more bogeys on the first round for that underdog pick. Um, and it has four par fives. Uh, the course, usually one of the most difficult par 71 tracks on tour. It's known for the snake pit, very tough three-hole stretch, 16, 17, and 18. That'll probably decide the winner uh, come Sunday. Hole 16 always catches my eye. I love that hole because it's got a dog leg right off the tee with water lining the whole entire right side, you know, making accuracy a must. Like if you overcompensate, hit it left, bunch of trees. Um, if you overfade it, of course, water is going to water. If you over whatever, hit it to the right, water is looming. Great hole. We're going to see like a myriad of clubs use off the tee. Like I remember Charles Schwartzel when he won here. Um, I think he hit like a three iron off this tee, left him like two hundred ten on his approach. He made par, ended up winning. Bill Haas, who was in the lead at the time, um, hit a perfect three wood. You know, like almost 300 yards right down the middle. But then he ended up short-siding his approach and bogey in the hole. Um, you know, 16, routinely the hardest hole on the course. And one of the most difficult holes on tour. Uh, Cop Red is deceptively long. Four of the five par threes, over 200 yards. All the par fives are over 550 yards. And only one par four is under 420 yards. Add the fact that driver off the tee is not normally a good play on most holes, and this course becomes a daunting task with positioning and long iron play being the key to success. Now, off the tee, golfers will be challenged with tight tree-lined fairways, massive dog legs, thickish rough, elevation changes, bunch of bunkers, and water in play on about five holes. Um, and I just lost my spot. Oh, the fairways are average in size, but tend to get more narrow the farther you get from the tee box. Most fairways on the course get extremely narrow at about the 300-yard mark off the tee. Now, because of this, average driving distance of Copper Red is one of the shortest on tour, routinely ranking in the bottom 10 in average driving distance. Precision and placement, more important than length and driver is left in the bag for most golfers on the majority of holes. The greens are usually firm and are average to above average in speed, 11 to 12 on the stip, unless you land the ball above the hole, since most greens here are sloped from back to front. The greens are average in size when you take into account only square footage, but it will look a lot smaller to tour players because they're going to be hitting mid to long irons on their approaches, uh, on their approaches for the majority of the holes. There are also some very long, skinny putting surfaces, which skews the average size of the greens. The par 3 4th and 14th come to mind as greens that are very long, but the landing area by the pin is usually very tight in width. As with most courses in Florida, the grass, is, uh, the grass on the greens is Bermuda grass, but it is overseeded with Poa Trivialis. Same type of grass we saw last week at Sawgrass and about a month ago, at waste management. Tambo, what are you looking for in golfers this week? Yeah, not much more than what you talked about. I mean, stats-wise, that's kind of what you stick to. We know this course. We've got history at it. We've seen it. I think the bigger thing this week is just going back to it again. Like, I'll bring it up because it's been brought up. I know last week it was brought up more. Talked with Hoop on the First Look Show a little bit today over on the Ship It Nation YouTube station. But this 5K price range being back in the mix again, like, I don't know that we've seen it yet. Right? Like it just continuously becomes a thing. And even when we get to it later, I know like it's a copo when you get to the content. People say, Oh, like you didn't talk about anybody down there. They just jammed 69 nice guys down at the bottom. 
There is only 15 guys in the 7K range this week. I believe that was the number. I'll double check it here now. Yeah. Now, these 15. 5K guys, they're not, like, not playable. I mean, Sam Ryder last week, 5K guy. I think he was top 10. Most birdies ever <laughs> at the at TPC Sawgrass. I had, him, I had him each way to eight places, and he couldn't even finish inside the top eight with the most birdies ever. So- so let me finish my strategy nugget here because that's what you just said is the key that I think people mess up. So, okay, maybe he was, and he comes through, and Sam Ryder's there, and you can go build an optimal that has him very easily after the fact or whatever. That makes perfect sense. But I think what people confuse is that. So there's almost 110 guys of this field are priced 6,900 or below. The people watching this, it's literally called the fantasy golf degenerates. We all know we can make up a story about so many of these guys down here, Kenny. Like you can go in the 5K range. Like, Aaron Wise is 5,900. We can go talk about his story. We You can go down Troy Merritt. There's lots of guys that we'll bring up and mention a few when we get down there. But I, I think if you're going to go down to this range, you need to commit. Like, you need to build enough Sam Ryder lineups, if he's your dude, last week, that you have a chance that ends up where it becomes a Scotty Zander lineup. Because think about it. Scotty probably would have ended up in them last week with Sam Ryder, but how many Scotty Zander rider lineups would you have got so my point is where people are like oh and i've said this for years if i just find this diamond in the rough well now they're bringing in more diamonds the more shiny pieces down in these ranges 110 golfers almost from 6900 and below if you start with they're not pumping the price on the top guy i know everyone thinks xander's gonna withdraw we'll get to that in a second he hasn't so there's no reason to think that he will if he does we'll know but they only price him at 11 2 so you still have 7800 average left when you go to Xander, and that's just a piece I want to extrapolate on because that's the whole point of all this, is if you're going to go down low, make sure you actually play some dude, play some of the dudes you're picking and not just try and pinpoint the one guy to get in there because even if you got 150 lineups and you take that one Sam Ryder lineup, what are the chances it was Sam Ryder with Xander and Scotty? And I only use them because that's almost what you'd have left over. for. Mo- you'd still have room to fit all the other guys. You're not, you're not leaving five grand on the table. So... I'm just making it very uh, results-oriented off of last week where people say, oh, no, but he's only 0.5% owned. That's the point. You don't need him then because nobody has him, and even those that do have him probably don't have him with the right combination or even close to the six-man parlay of what you can call it where you need to put six guys together to get the best fantasy score. So I'll keep that in mind as a strategy note here, but we'll get into the tiers when we get to it. It, It's just really watered down the 7k range is only 15 guys so you you know you got to do some do something different when you got that yeah but what are you doing for this 10k range yeah up top is interesting the you know xander play to me stands out as the best still Uh, i know burns has the history that's going to come with the ownership if there's any type of ownership discount i highly doubt it but honestly even if xander and burns were about the same i would still be fine after last week with xander and just how good of a player he is in general the strength of field, how he's that much better than it, and how the price didn't really get the bump that you would expect. Like, this is the type of field where I would expect to see 12-5 Xander, 11-9 Burns, and then drop it off from there or something. But again, they're not doing that, so it is, is what it is. Um, so Xander stands out. I guess the tougher one is between Spieth and Thomas. They're both pretty similar to me, though, honestly, on paper long term. And Speed's actually won here before. He was fine here last year. But everyone's going to look at, say, JT, uh, you know, the last three weeks has been better. Sorry, the last three times he played here has been better. And so go that way. They both missed the cut. They both were horrible. Did you see, by the way, the Smash GC, Taylor Gooch and those guys and Brooks Kepka, They, you know, after JT was talking that shit and then he missed the cut and Smash GC put up the scissor chop and said, you won't be saying nothing actually, pal, on this weekend. There's nothing that you have to worry about any asterisks because... You got cut. I thought that was some good uh, good stuff back and forth on social media, but probably going to be interested in one of these guys. I think it's going to be speed. Just take a shot because the, the thought process here, and again, who knows how it shakes out as the week goes on, could mix them back in and play different you know, double sets where you play both. But I'm just saying, I think the ownership is going to be there on Thomas. I'm not sure it's going to be there on speed. So Burns is my first cash game cornerstone. Pretty simple. Yeah. I mean, first, <laughs> first six in the last three years here. He's under $11,000. Um, it's very, very easy to put him uh, as the first cash game cornerstone. I mean, it just makes sense. Uh, so I'm going to go Burns. I don't know what I'm doing up here with the rest, though. It's possible that I play everybody. And because I the 9K range, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I like Cam Young. 
and I, you know, I like my cash play, but outside of that, uh, everybody else is sort of iffy for me. Um, so if I go, if, if they're iffy, I might only play Cam Young and then I play everybody else up in this 10K range um, and then go in that mold, um, you know, something like 30, 30, 30. And then like 20% burn because he's my, he in my cash line, uh, which I normally, you know, all max out. Anybody who's in my cash line of a 20% of my GPPs. I'm thinking I might go that way and then try and find somebody in the 8K range uh, to be like my highest own of like 40, 45%. Right now I'm leaning Aaron Rye. We'll see. Um, but I I don't know how I'm going to go about this range quite yet. I, I do, uh, of course, I, li I like Burns for my cast. I like Xander. Uh, a, a lot because I mean like he's been super consistent like I said like you know a win is probably there for him at some point in time there's no Scotty here there's no Wyndham Clark here he's by far the best player at least world ranking wise in this field uh this could be where he can get his W uh so I I, I I like him but we'll see I haven't made my final decision uh I'll probably have something for that decision when I go over my stuff on Gub's Corner with my Wednesday article. Now, the 9K range, I did say I had another cash game cornerstone. It's going to be Nick Taylor uh, over here at $9,100. Now, if you, you know, of course, he's been playing very, very well. He had that win, um, you know, a couple weeks ago, quite a few top finishes uh, this year. But the big thing about Nick Taylor is, you know, at this course, you need really good iron play, and you need to scramble very, very well because you're going to miss greens here, especially with the wind and stuff like that. If you In the last 24 rounds in this field, if you just put strokes gain approach and scrambling together, the number one player in the field, Nick Taylor. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and use him as my second cash game cornerstone. Like I said, the only other guy I'm really in love with here, you know, I, I'm thinking about Harmon, but Cam Young, and something about events where, you know, you need long irons. Like, hey, that's that's what I like him more. Even better than, you know, driver heavy, you have to be strong off the tee. I'd rather play uh, Cam Young in, in, in events where there's a lot of approach shots from 175 plus. And there are a lot of approach shots from 175 plus um, in this event, uh, in this course and he's second in the field last 50 rounds from 175 to 200 he always seems to do well in these type of events also tough course you know he's like top 10 four of his last majors majors are tough courses so i i, I cam is going to be my favorite gpp play uh in this 9k range outside of that everybody else is sort of eh you know i, I might end up going down here if i don't play speed Oh, uh, if I don't play JT, I still haven't made that decision yet. And a lot of that will probably have to do with if there's a wave, um, you know, a, a wave stack that we need to go to. So we'll see on that. Who do you like in this 9K range? Yeah, I should know too. Definitely going to be interested in the wave stacking as well. If it's going to, you know, whether it's there or not, I think this is a good spot for an inning in Florida. Typically it comes up. So that could change some things. But I do think just in general, kind of as the first look that we're doing here, uh, Cam Young, who you said was interesting, but I, I like the guys below him. Again, I just don't think when you're looking short term, long term, whatever people are looking at, you know, Cam Young is still okay and popping, but Sung Jay, 18th and 31st, and people saying maybe he's back, Kenny. So, so Sung Jay, I'm always going to have love for. Finau is, this is the thing, okay? Finau, you just went through it, but like Nick Taylor is 9,100. And I think that's where people are struggling. But this was one other interesting tip that I brought up earlier today for those that don't watch the First Look show. If you go short-term with Nick Taylor, he won the event that was JT's best recent finish of 12th in the last four events. Nick Taylor wins it. Then JT misses the cut. We're talking about $10,400 JT. 39th for Nick Taylor. Then you go to JT, oh, another 12th. What did Nick Taylor do? 12th. And then last week at the players, JT, cut. We said it earlier, missed cut. 26th place for Nick Taylor. Hey, he was yeah, but... on the first page of the leaderboard on Saturday. Right. But then someone's going to say, okay, but you're talking about two guys. Now, long term, I'm still with JT here. I'm not, there's no Canadian bias. No, no, I'm just saying. But even if you go like 18 months out in Fantasy National or wherever you want to go look at your models, things like that, and consider it, this man was winning tournaments, Nick Taylor, when we were talking about would JT even get on the Ryder Cup team? 
going through struggles then too. So, I mean, you're, you're really putting like JT's career, which is obviously much better versus Nick Taylor's and don't go in it that way when you're comparing this, this setup. But is my question to you is, is Nick Taylor crazy bad at 9,100 or is it a good spot that maybe people don't want to go to him because they think it's just out of line with pricing? I mean, like at this event, I got no problem with his price. I, I'm using him. Okay. He's one of my cornerstones. So I got no problem. Uh, yeah, okay. Then uh, that's what I was wondering. I, I kind of like him better uh, than some of the other options around there. So he'd be the other one I would consider there. Obviously, Harmon, who you talked about earlier, playing uh, just really good. The interesting part for Harmon is they get this tournament not good for whatever reason. You'd think it would set up perfect for him, but it just has not really. Um, but other similar tracks to this, if you take all like the, we just saw it at Sawgrass again. Colonials, the you know Harbor Towns, the PJ Nationals, some of these other courses that are similar um, setups or you know things that you could relate to it. He's shown up quite well at those courses, so it's all what you make of it. But I think like uh, the guys in the middle that might go overlooked, like if M Finau, Nick Taylor on the longer term stuff, they would still pop for me. So I'd have interest in them. AK range, Z Newt, third cash game cornerstone again. Last twenty four rounds, if you put stroke skiing approach. And scrambling together, but Zayden who is the sixth-ranked golfer in this field. Of course, he had that full win uh, with the Nick Dunlop win where he got the first-place money. Uh, he's had some strong finishes, short game solid, iron game very, very good. Inside the top 15 in proximity from 175 to 200 and 200-plus two, and 200 in the last 24 rounds. Uh, give me Bez uh, as... My third cash game cornerstone, my favorite GPP play in this range is Aaron Rye. Uh, it could be a little bit of recency bias. I was on uh, the Mayo Sweat Show on Friday, and of course, he almost holed out. Uh, he needed a birdie on the last uh, to, um, to, uh, to to make the cut. Yeah, he was on the pine straw, almost holed out, made the birdie. Uh, and, you know, he was in my cash lineup. Now, the cash lineup, I had uh, a cash in like three of my 10 doubles. So it wasn't great, but I wouldn't I wouldn't have cast it any, uh, you know, if of course uh, he did not um, uh, make that birdie. And the thing about Rye, when it comes to this event, I think it's perfect for him. Like uh, T to Green, he's solid, uh, avoids bogeys. Uh, the the proximity from 175 to two to 200 and 200 plus, well above average uh, in this field. He does really well on par threes. I mean, this guy, uh, I just really like his game. I think he can do something. Uh, he might be my highest on the GPPs. We'll see. I might go in that type of direction, go high on him, and then spread out a little bit up top. We'll see. Uh, that strategy's actually been paying off for me in GPPs. Um, I've been usually been able to get like one or two lineups every Sunday where, you know, I got a chance. You know what I'm saying? And that's all I'm asking for. Basically, because I'm playing the lottery. I'm playing the $5 drive the green. All I want is chances on Sunday to win the lottery. Uh, and sort of that type of like lineup construction where I, you know, focus on one guy in the 8K range. And he's my highest on like 40 to 50%. And then I, you know, still go above the field in the higher price guys. But, you know, I'm like 30, 30, 25, 30, something like that when it comes to the guys in the 10K range and the 9K range. And that's been working for me. So we'll see if it continues. Tamba, who do you like in the 8K range? Yeah, I think it just stands out that it's the same dudes. Like Bez, Rye, Gim, Hadwin, and then make your stand on your last guy, whether it's a McNeely or a Bradley or a Cole or something like that. But I think it would probably be Bradley or Cole that I would pick for like the GPP plays. The other plays stand out. They're all going to be played in GPPs. When we say that, we mean that obviously, you know, you're taking a little bit of risk like Keegan Bradley, uh, you know, second here three years ago when he played it. But if you look recently, he sort of fits the mold of what we saw this past weekend. Even at the players, we saw it again with guys like um, Gim and with Siwoo Kim and with the Gala where they just, they, they do the old Max Homa. They either miss the cut or they pop. And you look at Keegan Bradley lately, miss cut 36, miss cut 11. Really bad result, like 43rd or 45th, second. So that's what we're, we're playing it for. Can they show up in this field and make it happen? Eric Cole, even lately, miscut 21st, miscut 10th, 49th, 14th. So I think you want those guys in your pool still, and those are, those are going to be the pivot plays to the other guys around that. I think Keith Mitchell would fall into there as well, but just noting on some of the stuff early, it, it looks like the popular plays are going to be Bez, Rye, Gim, 
and maybe Hadwin. People always like Hostler for whatever reason. So, but just saying that's popular. The guys I would like for tournaments would be like the Mitchells, the Coles, the Bradleys, some of those guys that you can get probably at much lower ownership. That what's the real big difference around them? And then you could mix them in with some of those other guys there as well. Go ahead with the 7K range, Tampa. Yeah. Uh, one guy that popped for me a little bit off the top was Straka. Again, another guy that's he fits the mold of what I just talked about. He pops for me in a couple other places as well. Of course, specialist. He is usually. That's what we see. I mean, he pops in other places too, but he again just 16th, 57th missed cut. 12th, missed cut. 26. Like for this price point now, you're talking about just giving us some sort of top 25 upside and some some sort of find your way around, maybe have a spike round. Something like that. We know Taylor Moore is going to be popular. I like Putnam last week. I don't know how he ended up finishing. Looks like he fell off over the weekend, finished 53rd. He was 6,200 last week. It's quite, it's quite the price bump. But before that week, he was 8th. So I'm not sure um, if you can go back to him on some of the longer-term stuff. I, he didn't really pop. But Orschel on the longer-term stuff popped for me. Lucas Glover looks pretty good at 7,300. Again, this is a small range. And then just one note to make, like Daniel Berger, He's going to pop, especially if you're looking at models, Fantasy National, things like that. But remember, it's all his old, old, old stats. It has really nothing to do with what we've seen lately where he's missed three cuts and came 28th. So um, just note that on him. Other than that, I think uh, Akshay, he's a guy you can always take a shot on. Boom bust. Uh, I think he's fine. And then I'm interested to hear who Mayo likes down here, like between this guy Davis Thompson or Rio or something like that. I'll talk with him on Wednesday. But not a lot of other guys in this range for me, Kenny. What about you? Yeah, I like Taylor Moore. Like I said, I talked a bunch about him earlier on the underdog segment uh, of why I like him and why I probably have him in cash. Now, Sam Ryder, you know, you you feel like you're chasing when a guy does like 27, the most birdies ever, right? Um, but the thing is, he's this is a very, very similar course where, you know, the off the tee play is, is Sam's weakness. And of course, it's not really that big of a deal uh, at this course because so many people are clubbing down. Um, and another thing is, it's the exact same grass type. So you know he had to putt his ass off to to get 27 freaking birdies last week, right? He's going to the same type of green, like same type of grass. Like everything should be super familiar. Uh, you know, just right down the street. And, he, you know, he has that momentum. He's coming through. Um, I, I don't mind chasing him this week. Usually like a low price 7K guy that you're chasing from like last week's um, you know, really good performance. It's, it's not really like the best play you could do from a game theory perspective because they're always going to be like overly owned in what they should be probably. But I'd like Ryder. I just, everything sort of fits, right? And, and so so I, I'm going to go back to him. I have no problem going back to Sam Ryder. Horschel, pretty interesting uh, here. Florida, of course, you know, the man's the Florida guy. Really, really crushes the par threes. Uh, playing the par threes really, really well. Uh, you know, there's five of them uh, this week. And maybe a little Rio. He's a tune and of course, might be a little too difficult for him. So I might have to do a little bit more research because it seems just from like an outside looking in type of perspective that he does better on easier type courses. So I want to dig a little bit deeper. But when it comes to just stats, I mean, last 24, he's inside my top 20. Really good iron play. Really good from 175 to 200, um, avoiding bogeys, uh, you know. So someone to look at in the 7K range. Tamba, why don't you go to our 6K range? Yeah, this is where I have just a few. Like I said, 5K will get even worse, but just going down through it here. Um, I don't know if Damon's going to be popular after last week, but it's funny. He, he finally finds his game, so I hate to chase it, kind of what you just talked about, but it's mm -hmm. like if you do go back and look at some of the other stuff, even longer term for these types of setups and courses – and now, like you just talked about everything with the Sawgrass comparison and bringing it over, he does actually pop a little bit. So uh, maybe him. I kind of like uh, Mac Hughes at 6,700. Chesson Hadley, some of these courses, you, you can see him in the easier fields at least that he can pop up. Matt Kuchar could grind 6,500. Again, another guy at these types of courses. Bud Colley, uh, another guy like Berger just to keep an eye on because a lot of those stats are going to be older. So just a note on him. And then... I think Mayo will talk me into a lot of Carson Young. So he was – Every week, had, right? Yeah, 6300 I mean, the price is just sitting there. After that, though, I don't think much else, man. Like, there, again, there's not much down here for me, but uh, maybe some J.J. Spawn, too. I might put him into the mix. But, yeah, that, that's about it down here. 
Um, Jimmy Stanger impressed me last week. Like I got to see a lot of them in some featured groups. Um, I like his game. I'll play him for $6,900. Uh, I like Max Hughes down here when it comes down to him, one of the best around the green and one of the best in the field in par five scoring. Those are two pretty important things here uh, when you think about it because there are four par fives still here at a par 71, uh, which of course is rare. I think this will probably be one of the only courses on tour where that happens. Uh, so I do like that. I do like the fact that he can get it up and down with the best of them. Uh, so I do like Max Hughes down here. Uh, Taylor Pendrith, your Canadian brethren, he just rates out very, very well for me. Um, you know, stat wise, when it comes down to it, his long irons are really, really strong, really good at par five scoring. Um, bogey avoidance, shockingly, you wouldn't think that from, from Mr. Pendrith, but in the last 24 rounds, he's seventh in the field in bogey avoidance. Now, you sort of got to look back and see what courses that he's played. Um, I guess I could do that real quick because, of course, if he's playing like all the easy, you know, courses, that stat will be a little bit skewed. Uh, but, I mean, you're looking at the players. You're looking at a uh, Honda. You're looking at Farmers. Um, you're, you know, so those aren't, you know, easy courses. Uh, so he's, he's getting it done uh, with the bogey avoidance. So I do like Pendrith uh, a lot. Um, oh, and my final cash game cornerstone. It's going to be Mr. Grayson C at 6,300. Again, when you take in stroke skiing approach and you take in scrambling, and I, I got to give credit. I saw this. Somebody posted these stats on Twitter, on X. I don't remember who it is. Uh, it might have been Ron Claus, but I'm not sure. So I apologize for not giving you the credit for this, but if somebody posted this on Twitter. Uh, and that's where I got this information from. If you did, shoot me a DM and I'll retweet your tweet for you, okay? Uh, so uh, looking at Grayson Sig, when you take in stroke gain approach and you take in scrambling into account, last 24 rounds, third in the field. In the last 24 rounds, he's ranking fifth in my model, sixth in approach, first in par three scoring, fourth from 175 to 200. For 6,300 bucks, I think he's played this course once and made the cup, right? So for 6300 bucks to get a punt play and play three guys at 8800 8700 or more, uh, that's how I'm going about my business. And I still have about 1500 k 15000 left uh, to fill out my lineup. So cash game cornerstones for this week, and I do like them, which also probably means they're going to suck. But uh, cash game cornerstones first. It's going to be Sam Burns at 10900 Nick Taylor uh, at 9,100. Christian Bzinut, 8,800. Grayson Sig, 6,300. Like I said, I think it leaves you like 14,9. Plenty to put Taylor Moore and somebody else in your cash lineup. So other guys, I went over quite a few guys in that 6K range uh, that I like, like right on the number is 6K. Uh, Matty Smith was sort of in contention. Last week for like the first two or three days, again, playing a similar type Florida course, same type greens, you know, less than driver off the tee. Yeah, you got to hit fairways, but same. It's like a less than driver type course. Uh, so we're going back uh, to the Matty Smith. I'm not going to go crazy on him. Okay. And, it, and, and if he's going to be like 10% owned, 9% owned, like one of the highest owned in the six range, I might think about a fade. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know that, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to be 5% or less, right? Uh, also, in this range, in the 5K range, let's just go on down. Justin Lower seemed like somebody that I could get behind at this was in contention, uh, you know, a month, month and a half ago. He has games. He makes cuts. Um, so I do like Lower. Um, other guys like Zach Blair finished 10th year last year. Um, he has, like, that thing you were talking about, Tampa, where he could finish high or just completely miss the cut. He's sort of in that mold, maybe not as high as like other guys in like the 6K range or 7K range, but he can get up there top 25 for you. He's done it before at this course. Um, and I, Aaron Badley is another guy that I just threw in because of the putting, because of his around the green play uh, and his bogey avoidance. And, you know, at that price tag, you know, you're taking a risk, whatever. Um, that's about it. I don't really like anyone below 5,600. Now, we'll see. I'll probably end up rostering one or two. Here's some podcasts. Somebody smarter than me says they like someone. I might end up playing them. Uh, but we'll have to see. It's tough under 5,600. Who do you like in the 5K? Yeah, almost nobody. 
Like yeah. I, I, we could it's have the right. yeah. Tyler Duncan is a guy that I sometimes play. Uh, you know, he's maybe fine. Justin Lower, um, you know, going down the list. Uh, Lipsky, I'll sometimes play. Lipsky Reelman, is interesting. Um, Long term, but like again, it's mainly course history stuff that I'm not that into. So yeah, I really like I said, just think you're you're looking for a diamond in the rough for no reason. So I don't think anything major to go into. Uh, you can play. I, I was I was showing this today too, Kenny. You can play uh, Burns. It was Burns. Taylor, you're you're you who? Oh, Taylor Moore, right? Is Taylor Moore in your cash game cornerstones? Yep. No, 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 no. But I did say he was my fifth player. Yeah, either way. Sorry. Yeah, I gave away the fifth for you if you did. You did say it. I think that's what I thought. My point was you could play Burns more and then take your pick of like a Bez who you liked. Or if some people think McNeely is is wrong price because he's back now and he's been so good since coming back from the injury and all that stuff. It's whatever. The medical extension. You, you look at all that stuff. You still had like 7,500 left per golfer. There's just nothing that really requires it for what I see a, a, a setup here. Any, anything could happen. But I just don't see it being a big deal, and I'm going to stick to that for this week. So bets. I haven't made a bet yet, but I do have a card that I put down. Uh, I'm not making a bet till I figure out the wave advantage. So probably not till Wednesday. But I did make like bets that caught my eye. Uh, Bazin the dude, 50 to 1. Taylor Moore, 60 to 1. And these are all with eight places. Um, Taylor Moore, 60 to 1. Um, uh, Davis Riley, who's just... just Randomly has done well at this course. 150 to 1. SH Kim, 140 to 1. Maddie Schmid, 140 to 1. Zach Blair, it was 250 to 1. Now it's 150 to 1. I haven't made any of these bets. I'm waiting until uh, the way to advantage, but those are the ones that, like, when I first looked at the numbers, just caught my eye. Yeah, no, I don't hate it. I, I did the same. Like, I didn't place anything yet. So. Um, you know, some of those guys I like too, but it's just not been super, super high priority lately. So just looking at it, like you said, waiting on wave advantages or last week, I really hated it. It was a week before last and I was talking bear off. You weren't on with me and we were talking about how the board set up at the API. There was like 30 guys, 25 to one or worse. Like I don't need, it's then you're just similar stuff. You're just picking your two that you like or three that you like and just rolling it. But I don't know. It wasn't like a, a main priority. Try and rather, rather try to take these tournaments down than, Pick a, a needle in a haystack from those weak numbers. So I didn't see, see much crazy that you think taking a GBV down is 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 easier than hitting an outright. Bet. It's not even close. It, that's not the statement. I'm saying I would rather just put more money into that where I'm trying to do that and have you know success at a real payout mm -hmm. versus trying to figure out who my 25 to one guy is and just throwing it out there. So yeah, yeah. It, it's how I always do it. I just I got no problem with that. And then some of the higher stakes, smaller field stuff. It's not that the odds get better. You're playing against much better players. It's more of I'd rather that's like this week is a forty seven hundred dollar tournament with two hundred grand to first two hundred and thirty four people of the best you, in the world. Right. You yes. want the bag. I, I want to try and get that. That's how I've always yeah. done it. So I yeah, I that. don't spend as much time grinding these things as probably as I should or as others do. It's not even the best ball. It's the same when people talk to you about that. Like I, I don't spend a lot of time even on this majors best ball. I'm gonna have a look at it because with underdog and all that, I'm kind of excited for it this year because it's for the majors and it's coming up and I'll, I'll take a look at it, but it's just not something I put the extra time into and I probably should. I don't like to change the balance. What What's the balance that we always talk about? You know, like the, forget the word, the chi or something like that. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. And that's why, that's why it's, you know, it's been, here's the thing about underdog because it's not, it's not my money. It's not betting. You got to remember, like I told you guys last week, they paid me by putting the money in my account. Right. And so it's like not even my money. I can't even withdraw that money until I spend that amount. So basically, like I have to win, and I did. I won almost ten thousand dollars. I'm I'm golden now, right? Uh, and I still have all their money in my account. So I'm playing with house money, okay? and that's why I'm max betting everything. That's why I'm. And so I, I I get what you're saying because you know I was like you're playing those those smaller field, um, higher dollar entry things where you know you can win like a, still a big time amount. Um, for me, when it comes to DFS, I'm just not as good at GPP, so I can't be putting forty seven hundred dollars on like yeah. one or on like one to one line. I don't, I don't play forty seven hundred dollars in ten weeks, right? In DFS, and uh, I, that's I don't buy I, into that. That's if I have a ticket. I more so mean about adding things to your life. Adding underdog and making some picks on there is yeah. probably fine. I mean, you're doing well with it. Congrats again, huge week for you. But just saying it like 
when people are like, oh, you got to play every sport. You got to grind every slate. You got to no, do no, I think no, that's no, bad no, advice. No, no. No. And I always try and I me. only do golf. Yeah. This is weird. I only gamble golf in NFL. So what this time of year, I don't do it anything. That's the take. Yeah, right? I have yeah. a, I have a, a, I was just away. My wife of 10 years. First off, that's how you keep a wife, a good wife of 10 years. You, you have that balance. But I'm saying when you people try and do too much and change it up, and now they got to grind this sport and this slate and adding it, like it's, you know, you got to have a balance in life, and that's the key to it all. So I don't add a bunch of things just to do it. Betting is easy. Everyone says, oh, you can just go pick your five picks and place it. It's just I, I don't feel like I have to bring five bets just because that's what we've always done. So that's where I look yeah. at it as, you know, some weeks I'll just say, you know what? Not going to, I didn't see anything off the top that I'm jamming. Usually it's bear off yeah. talking me into something. I didn't have that this week because I was getting back from vacation. But in general, I'll, find your balance. I'll be honest. I'm playing $100 less in DFS, so 20% less in DFS this year um, because I shifted that money to more gambling uh, because I've had more success. Like, like I said, it, since I started playing with each ways, I'm actually up. Like, you know, which is crazy. Like, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, when it comes to each of that, so, so I have been more successful in that range and my cash games are fine. They're doing well. Uh, but I, I, I like to, 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 I like the gambling because I feel like I have a better chance, especially with the each ways uh, to do what I need to do. And, and so I've actually taken money out of DFS. I play $400 a week now instead of $500 a week. And then in, in gambling, instead of betting $150, i am betting $250 now uh, a week. And so that's just what I've done. Um, anyway, I think we're going uh, a little off target Tambo. Tell them where they can find you. Yeah, on X or Twitter, at Totag and Tambo. Tidbits will be back this week. I know a lot of people are looking for them. But don't do them. Any crazy short weeks, I don't do them. If I'm away, I don't do them. They're free. They come out the weeks that I'm here. They all, you know, I barely ever miss. So I don't mind. I don't feel as bad. I appreciate everybody that's always reaching out and looking for them. I always will get them out to you when I can. They'll be back this week and moving forward. So you can count on those. Go check it out on X at Totag and Tambo. And then, of course, ShipItNation.com. Promo code Mayo gets you 10% off. You can go there. Got everything going on. I had a huge week. Last week, Saturday, we took down first, second, and third. That's members of the community. And that was like... Four lineups into 60K. Our guy, Pickett, got to give him a shout out, does all of our free tennis stuff. It's just a community Discord channel. He won second for 20K. Huge Sunday for a bunch of members. Just an awesome time right now. Check out shippingnation.com if you guys want to join a community and have some fun. Use promo code MAYO for 10% off. You can find me on X at Kendo VT. Actually, like three of the wins I had this past week, I posted all my, all my timeline. Like, you guys could have won too. <laughs> so, so there you go. Also, you can find me on gupscorner.com. Uh, I have my article there every week. It's my course preview. It goes over stats to look for, trends, my final betting card, any changes to my cash game cornerstones, my fade of the week. This is my worst fade of the week, I think. This For the players, it was Sahit. Uh, so that didn't work out. But I, I've been crushing that as well. So make sure you go check that out. Should be a fun week. Uh, the players got me out. I'm ready for a great season. Let's get this done. Let's win some motherfucking money. DJ Nation. I've been getting dirty money, Jordan Belfer. Stacking penny stocks while I'm flipping these birds. Sipping on Ciroc, trip them up with the words. 